Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Representative Tom Burdett, and I'll be chairing the meeting this morning. Um, our, uh, and uh, Coach uh, Representative Christie will be the vice chair today, and Representative Ghostlant will be our ranking member today. Um, we're going to be discussing H-112, an act relating to raising the juris jurisdictional limit for small claims. And, and we're going to start, even though uh, we're not going to go in order to start as far as our witness list goes, we're going to start with Daniel Richards, the attorney for Access to Justice Coalition. And um, Attorney Richards, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's actually Richardson. I, um, oh, okay. It's, it's a, <laughs> just a small note. I don't want to uh, lose those two letters. I've heard no, it. no. It, uh, <laughs> Um, Let's keep on, on. <laughs> exactly. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much for accommodating my schedule. Uh, my name is Dan Richardson. Uh, I'm an attorney in private practice in Montpelier, Vermont at uh, Tarrant Gillis Richardson and Shems. And uh, as part of uh, my volunteer service, I am on the Access to Justice Coalition Board, um, which is a coalition of a variety of um, legal service providers, particularly to low income Vermonters, and that includes uh, representatives from the Vermont Supreme Court, uh, legal aid, uh, legal services of Vermont, uh, the uh, Vermont Bar Association, and the Vermont Bar Foundation, as well as the Vermont Law School. Um, so the Access to Justice Coalition does not have an official position on, on this bill. We have not been able to meet to, to take any particular position. So I'll, I'll speak today really out of my own experience and um, from an access to justice perspective, but it is it is strictly my own. Um, in addition to my work on the Access to Justice Committee, I've served as an acting small claims court judge for uh, 10 years. So uh, I do bring that experience to bear. So the issue of small claims court jurisdiction um, is an access to justice issue, um, but not necessarily as you would expect. Um, and I think there's really two, two sides to this coin. Um, so on the first side, and, and, and I should say both the Vermont Bar Association and Legal Aid um, have representatives who are part of the coalition uh, who will be testifying today and, and will demonstrate, I think, both sides of this coin. Uh, on one side, small claims court, you know, is intended as a, in a, and actually functions as an effective and simple forum for individuals to bring claims and to seek monetary damages. Uh, you know, as an acting small claims court judge, I've really witnessed those types of encounters where people have come forward, felt that they've, they're, they've had their day in court, their voices have been heard, that they've either received judgments or uh, in some cases they've been ruled against them, but they felt that they had an opportunity to present their case, to make their best argument. Um, and so allowing more claims into this process is a good idea. And it is true that there is a large gap between the $5,000 limit, the, the ceiling right now on small claims court, and what's economically practicable to bring into superior court because the expenses to bring a full claim into superior court rise substantially. Um, and to the extent that you would raise it to $10,000, you'd start to close that gap. Um, and that it wouldn't just simply be for litigants who had a $5,000 to $10,000 claim. It would really fall, you know, if somebody had a $25,000 claim or $15,000 claim, they could bring a small claims court action and simply waive anything above the $10,000 limit. And we already see this in small claims court where somebody who has maybe a $7,000 claim will bring a small claims court action and, and, and say, I understand I'm not gonna get more than 5,000, but 5,000 is better than zero and 7,000 doesn't justify me going into superior court. So, I mean, it does allow a, a, a range of cases involving individuals that would be allowed to come into court um, that are not seeking court right now because it's just not practicable. Um, 5,000 may not be worth their time to go into court if their claim is $25,000. Um, and so raising this does allow that sort of category. But at the same time, there's another side to this coin, and I think it's an important one to consider, 
And I know that, and uh, Patricia Gable from the court administrator's office may be uh, here to speak about some of those issues. And I, so I won't dive deeply into that because I know that the court itself has attempted to talk about some of, or address some of these, these issues as far as um, credit card collection cases and whether small claims court is the right form for those cases to be brought. But as it stands right now, small uh, credit card cases and, and third party debt collection cases are able to be brought into small claims court. And these numerically make up a wide uh, majority of the cases that we see in small claims court. I mean, uh, by, by and large. And these cases are very different than the idea of small claims court as sort of a forum for individuals to uh, sort out claims against each other. They look very different than those type of cases. In, the, in, in debt collection cases or cre consumer credit card cases, plaintiffs have counsel each and every time. Defendants almost never do. This type of litigation is a high volume litigation. So the attorneys that are bringing the claims are um, you know, filing thousands of them a year uh, in the court system. You know, There's a small group of debt collection attorneys that do this type of work and they go all around the state and they file you know, hundreds in each county. Um, these cases are often paper cases where what the plaintiff has are records. Sometimes they're generated because they're the credit card company. Sometimes they're bought um, and they're bought in high volume. And so while small claims court rules do, breed, do have those type of um, uh, requirements that the, that the plaintiffs make out the prima facie case, the basic case, um, it's often really difficult to sort through because the plaintiff has a bunch of paper records. They don't necessarily have a live witness. Um, and the debtor, if that debtor shows up, you know, usually is not equipped to either make objections uh, on evidentiary basis for these business records or um, is not equipped to um, think, uh, handle the type of meritorious uh, objections that they might make to the merits and substance of the case. They, they struggle with it and you can see them um, struggling with it. Um, these cases often feel like assembly lines um, and the process for trying them on the merits you know, are I think fair to say problematic. Um, you know, we do in small claims court the best job possible, but I, I don't think anybody walks away thinking the same type of justice is served as when individuals come and they're able to fully vet their cases. It's really a different beast. Um, credit card contracts and small, uh, apologize. Um, the other thing is that credit card uh, cases often allow for fee shifting. So there is a, a certain risk to a defendant. Um, now this cuts both ways. You know, if, if the fee shifting occurs in superior court, that can create a greater expense to them if they, and as opposed to going to small claims court where the fees are lower. Um, but at the same time, it, it, it does create an issue where there is risk and usually it's to the debtor um, to challenge these cases or to uh, push against the process. So, why is this important for a, a bill that deals with a threshold? Uh, it's just simply the fact that if you raise the threshold to $10,000, you're going to get more of these credit card cases. And just as you, there are cases out there from individuals who are not filing cases because of the jurisdictional threshold and the difference between that and going to Superior Court, the same are true for these debt collection cases. And so I think it's a valid concern and it's an access to justice concern um, that these that raising the jurisdictional limit would potentially bring those cases in. Now I know, um, and I've talked with Terry Corsones at the VBA, and I know that other states deal with this by creating two different types of jurisdictional limits: one for individuals and one for um, one for credit card companies or tr to these class of claims. And that's certainly a direction that I think uh, this this legislature could go in to create that. Um, and I think that certainly goes at the problem itself. Um, but I think that's really the big issue and concern that I would have, or that anyone in the access to justice community would likely have is to not do harm um, or give an advantage to 
these type of claims that you know are in and of themselves problematic. And, and I would say that I think there's a larger issue well beyond this bill about how these type of, of cases are handled. Um, and we've seen in just, for example, the post-judgment realm, uh, there's a real struggle with that. And in some cases, small claims court is really well suited for the post-judgment portion of it because it has a financial disclosure component that superior court doesn't have that, that really is very effective in helping sort out people with um, disability or, or other economic reasons not to be collected against. The small claims court does that well, but it also doesn't, um, it, it, we've run into trouble and we've seen in, in certain counties where um, people have been arrested for debt. Um, and that's not a good thing. And that's, uh, you know, that's led to other trouble. And, and certainly in small claims court, that, that issue was there until the court really removed that problem. But it's, it's indicative of, of these type of cases is that there's a certain point at which the court can't provide any further um, relief or, or action uh, for a judgment uh, creditor. So, that's in heart the essence of my testimony. I'm happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Um, you know, it's it's really sort of a non-position, but I think these are the two important con uh, considerations that this this committee should should consider. And I think it's a very good idea that that you're having this discussion. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Great, thank you very much. And I see Representative Rachelson has her hand up. Um, good morning, Judge. Thank you for, for coming this morning. This is um, quite interesting. And it, I have heard from so many people um, that they didn't feel like small claims court would be able to um, be a good vehicle for them because of the amount. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, um, I like the idea of different amounts for um, individuals versus credit card companies. I'm wondering if there would be um, any, if it would be worth pursuing having a, a credit court that would just be separate period, that maybe there could be training for litigants who don't have counsel. I know that some of the judges have been doing that and just remove that from small claims court and really just carve it out. Well, that's a, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I, I know that the civil rules committee actually was seeking to do, they, uh, in August, they announced a proposed rule that would actually have removed credit card cases from small claims court entirely and put them within superior court. You know, the court and the judiciary has um, had uh, some resistance to the idea of creating um, specialized courts. I mean, I think they're more flexible on the idea of dockets. Um, I would be happy to talk and I can talk at, at great length about um, why credit card cases are different for that exact reason. And, and there are reasons why, you know, often the most important part of a credit card case, collection cases, ability to pay. Skip the merits for a moment. If this person's on disability or this person is has no income, the case is over. It, it should be, you know, just kicked out and never touched because this person is is uncollectible against and it's a waste of both the creditor's to, uh, time as well as the court's time right. to entertain it. And too often I see that in small claims court where I'm in a post-judgment hearing um, and the, I, I call it the little old lady with the walker who comes in for the first time on a motion for contempt uh, because she hasn't appeared any other time. And she said, I just got out of bed. I've been sick. I'm on permanent disability and I'm 85. And it's the case is over. No, no one's, you know, the, the creditor goes back and it's, it was really a waste of time, all the prior filings in some respects. So um, are you at all worried about the, like, so let's say we do have some kind of cap on the credit card ones. Are you worried about the volume of cases in general? Like, do we have enough um, wherewithal to be able to handle the increase? Well, I, I think we do. Uh, I mean, at least I can speak, I've only served in Washington County and um, I know that they've done a really good job of keeping those, but certainly credit card cases, there's a lot. 
Um, and it's a, it's a, like I said, it feels like an assembly line when these cases come up. Um, individually, I, I don't think there's a problem. I think raising the $10,000 floor or ceiling uh, would, would easily be, uh, the court could easily account for those, uh, notwithstanding any sort of COVID related issues that, that might cause docket uh, delays or backups. But um, I think it's the credit card cases that would be significant. And I've got a couple more quick questions. One is, do you recommend the fee going up because the amount is going up? I mean, I'm not sure I do, but I'm just wondering if you discuss that. I haven't. I think that's one of those issues that I would I would certainly defer to the court because the fees often have less to do with the judgment and more about keeping them low keeps people able to access this court. Um, but it, it's certainly a consideration as to if there's a greater volume, whether there's a greater need for um, revenue. So the other piece that I'd ask is, it seems like it would be important to embed a public education component to make sure people know, hey, you can go to small claims court. And I'm wondering if in general, from your experience, if you feel like people um, are well prepared or you know, would a document that would also educate people about being ready for small claims court and new limits um, be important? I so it, 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 it rides along the schism. Individuals that come into small claims court, I, gotta, I have to say, are almost always well-prepared, thoughtful, um, earnest in, in their claims and in their defenses. And you know, it's a really empowering process for them because they bring their case, they hear, you know, if they have a, uh, an opportunity to be heard, it's really a powerful process. Um, but if um, in credit card cases, it, it's very much the opposite. And I think it, it's sort of in part of the process that we're talking about claims, credit card claims that are really, really old. Um, you know, everybody's sort of stretching the limits of the statute of limitations of the right to bring these cases. And so, you know, that's where you often see struggles um, because people have dodged credit card cases, th these cases for a long time, and then they come into court and they're just not prepared. And my very last question, which I've been asking um, our committee this week is, rather than just put in 10,000, should we add an economic indicator so that um, there would be some look at this on a regular basis without us having to remember that some, you know, for somebody to be thoughtful and say, oh my gosh, we haven't done this in 15 years or 20 years or whatever. Um. I, I don't think necessarily so. I mean, I think this is, as, as you can see here, this decision is really less about, in, I mean, it's partially about inflation and the, and the change in the value, what, what, what $5,000 equals today as opposed to 2007, but there's also policy decisions and it's, it's hard to short circuit those. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to have to end the questioning with uh, uh, Mr. Richardson. I, I know he has to get to another meeting. And uh, uh, if anybody has any other questions, uh, uh, maybe you could connect via email. Um, I'm, I'm certainly available and happy to do so. Right. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I, I guess we will uh, jump back on the order of, the, uh, um, of our agenda. And next we have the Chief Superior Judge, uh, Brian Grierson. I'm pretty sure he's here anyway. <laughs> he, he is now. He, he is, yeah. He, he wasn't earlier, but I am now. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you to the committee for inviting me. Uh, for the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. Um, I wasn't here to hear all of what uh, Dan had to say, but I certainly heard uh, the bulk of it, and um, I, I, I don't know that I disagree with with his comments. Um, you know, the I, I have surveyed the judges uh, who are involved in these dockets, and uh, I, I'm still waiting to get responses from them, uh, and so I don't have a full um, full response from them now. I, I also want the committee to be aware. Uh, that we have a standing uh, 
it's called a civil oversight committee that gets involved in discussions um, similar to what is going on um, in, within this committee. And they are looking at, um, as well as the civil rules committee, looking at this issue that Dan was referring to around the uh, debtor uh, credit card cases, because they, as he indicated, take up a substantial uh, volume number in the small claims docket. The small claims docket at this point um, has gone through some uh, changes um, that we have contemplated moving the uh, debtor cases, credit card cases into superior court. One of the things that is different now than it was I'll say a year ago, is that with the uh, introduction uh, and of the, our new case management system and the transition from courts to that uh, new case management system, and the last group of seven courts are beginning that process literally as we, we're speaking. So all the courts, with the exception of the Supreme Court, will be uh, working with the new case management system uh, by this spring. One significant change that that has brought about specifically in the small claims docket is Dan's uh, testimony is important because he probably has as much experience in the, the small claims docket as anyone. He sits, did sit regularly um, as, an, as an acting judge in the small claims docket um, for a number of years and, and does come to the committee with a wealth of experience with this docket. Because we've gone to the Odyssey system, uh, we're not in a position certainly at this point um, to train attorneys on that system. And therefore we can no longer use attorneys as acting judges uh, in this docket. So all of these cases will now be heard either by superior court judges or in some cases I have assigned uh, probate judges who are law trained judges uh, to hear these uh, dockets. The, the reason that acting judges were used among other um, differences in the small claims docket from our other dockets is that the judge who hears the original case, um, the individual the individuals, the parties, can appeal the decision by the original judge to the to a superior court judge, and therefore we had used acting judges, attorneys, um, for these dockets, so that if there was an appeal, that appeal would go to the sitting superior court judge. That's part of the reason um, that we used attorneys. Um, so that, that is a significant change in, in this docket for us. So in looking at this proposed change, and I can understand the reason uh, why on the surface increasing the jurisdictional limit um, makes sense, uh, because with the passage of time, obviously uh, a dollar doesn't mean today what it did 10 or 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And many of the judges who have um, responded to me so far are in support of this change. But I think Dan has really identified the issue from what we see. This would not mean an increase in filings in the small claims docket necessarily, or not a significant increase. What it will do though is change the, the, the composition of that docket in the way that he described, and that is, we would expect, again, the uh, debtor, uh, the credit card cases to be increased substantially uh, in, in the stocket by increasing the jurisdictional limit. And he, again, uh, did a good job of describing uh, that process. Um, so that, that is the concern that, that I bring to this committee and Although I haven't had a chance to talk with uh, Terry Corsones or, or Dan about the, the concept that he talked about, 
I think it is worth exploring and I will explore with uh, the judges involved in this docket, whether or not a, essentially a two-tiered system um, for those credit card cases makes sense. As I said, and Dan indicated, the, the Civil Rules Committee is looking at moving these credit card cases into the Superior Court. And maybe as a middle ground with this increase in the jurisdictional limit, that we consider allowing small claims jurisdiction amount to increase to the $10,000, but uh, any credit card cases would still be capped at $5,000. Otherwise, they would have to file in the Superior Court. There are definitely pros and cons uh, to that concept, but I think it's worth, uh, worth the court uh, looking at that as, a, as an approach. Um, that, that's, that's the information that I have for the committee. On one hand, uh, we're not opposed to this, but we're not supporting it at this point. And we'd really need uh, more time for me to get a better understanding of, um, I think it would help the committee for me to have a, more uh, input from the trial judges and the civil oversight committee uh, as to how they how they view this change. Great, thank you, Judge. Uh, any questions for Judge Grierson? Barbara? Um, hi, Judge Gerson. Do you have a sense of how long it would take for you to get that input? Oh, I expect there, as I said, the Civil Oversight Committee um, meeting is, is um, they're meeting this morning. Um, and I have circulated uh, requests to the judges. I expect to have a better, a more, a more complete response by next week. Great, thank I, you. Yeah. Selena? Um, this may be one of the things that you can answer better with, with more input and information, but I definitely would be interested in hearing more of your opinion on the pros and cons of the um, you know, you said there are sort of pros and cons to capping the, the credit card um, limit and well, I there think more you want to share now or if you just or if it really makes sense. No, to I'll give you a, you know, a brief uh, <clears throat> comment and, and it, it really, again, it mirrors some of what uh, Dan Richardson was saying and that is um, the small claims docket is designed I mean, it was designed for small claims, for the, for the uh, folks who are unrepresented, uh, to bring their disputes to the court, to uh, hopefully get a quick resolution. Y your arguments are heard, plaintiffs and defendants, usually no attorneys involved. Um, and the rules of procedure, the rules of admitting exhibits and documents, evidence to the court are relaxed. It's supposed to be a relatively quick, um, I'll say, I'll use the term summary in that people bring their um, uh, disputes to the court, the court hears them, and invariably the decisions are made on that day at that time. Um, and and that's, that's the, that was the overarching idea behind it. That has, that has changed over the years and to the point where the credit card industry has so dominated this docket that that's what the most of the cases are. Um, and they are a different type of case. Um, and, and Dan, I think, touched on that. They're different in that they oftentimes um, involve legal issues as opposed to factual disputes, you know, uh, was the contract, did, did the contractor agree to do X, Y, and Z for so much money? And to what extent did he do it? Or was it done properly? That's what I think of as small claims. Before I was on the bench, I guess I'll say officially, I was an acting judge and, and did the small claims docket. And those are the kinds of disputes we would see now. Obviously, this goes back some time since I've been on the bench for a while. But that's the nature of the disputes that, that we were used to dealing with in small claims, and that has changed dramatically. Um, 
And so it's changed uh, the way the courts uh, handle these cases. And as Dan indicated, um, because there is a jurisdictional limit, when you increase the limit, you're actually going beyond uh, $10,000 in the sense that I'm sure there are credit card cases that are being brought now where the claim is in excess of $5,000, but they're bringing them in small claims court because um, they hopefully will get a, a quicker um, resolution and it's worth uh, compromising the amount due to sometimes get that uh, resolution uh, quicker. I think the same thing will happen when you increase the, the limit to $10,000 and that is there will be claims that they're bringing that are actually, uh, they're not gonna be able to collect over $10,000, but it'll, it'll increase the number coming in, not only up to that $10,000 limit, but something beyond that, uh, where they make a, an economic decision that uh, will forego X amount of money because of this process. So those, you know, you can either say that's a pro and a con, um, that means more individuals and, for the most part, and I'll, I know that um, Gene Murray and, and others will be testifying. I think you'll find that there's clearly under uh, underrepresented in a lot of cases, uh, the defendants, meaning the people who owe the money. This will expand that number and certainly expand to the extent that uh, legal aid has the ability to provide uh, representation. It'll expand the, the demand on them to do this. So there, those are, I think, some of the factors the committee uh, needs to look at. Um, there, there was a time uh, when uh, assistant judges, uh, county judges, did sit on these cases, um, but that, that, that is no longer the case. Um, and for the length of time that I have been um, in this position uh, of the chief superior judge, no assistant judges have asked for training in that regard. In no small part because they're not, they have become more complicated in the sense that they involve, uh, the credit card cases are more in the nature of uh, legal arguments uh, and matters of law. Uh, Dan mentioned the statute of limitations, which is a, always an ongoing uh, issue in these cases, or frequently, I should say that. Um, so the the small claims court has changed over over time, and this would be another change, and it has um, some benefits because it still does provide that vehicle for uh, hopefully summary uh, resolutions of disputes. But in raising that limit, you're also inviting. Uh, the industry to to continue to use the court in that in that fashion. Hopefully that. Great. Oop. Sorry. Nope. I'm Thank you, uh, Coach. You, your hand is up. You are muted, Coach. There you go. Yeah. You know, one of those buttons that keeps going back and forth. Uh, <laughs> Good morning, Judge. How Good are morning, you? Coach. Good to see you. Um, what I was getting feedback on from uh, constituents uh, with regard to um, uh, the the actions is, uh, and and I think you hit on it a little bit with the uh, the industry itself, uh, because what. Um, <clears throat> Uh, a number of folks have shared with me is the fact that uh, the old account would be sold to uh, yeah. a group and then it goes to another group. And, and so like they didn't even know that it still was out there because it had already affected them uh, negatively um, uh, as a, uh, as a closed you know, account and, you know, all of these things. Uh, and then, you know, two, three years later, it surface, you know, in the form of a summons or something of, of that regard. Uh, how, 
it's kind of a global question, I guess, you know, and, and I'd, I'd, I'd guess a number of witnesses, uh, I would pose that, you know, too, is how do you think that's going to affect? Because, you know, we understand the statute of limitation and yet does, does it move with every transaction? You know, so like if, if there's a seven year, you know, limit, and then it gets uh, sold to somebody else. They get seven years. You know, I. Coach, um, <laughs> the, that becomes the the issue in many of these cases, and and um, how the statute of limitations is interpreted on an individual case depends on the 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 facts and the, and the paper trail, if you will, that comes into court. In other words, usually the, uh, the individual who had a credit card with some company, whatever it was years ago, uh, they don't even recognize the name of the, of the, of the individual or a company that has now bought that account. And they may not have had contact with anybody for a number of years. And, and again, I think uh, Jean, uh, Ms. Murray can, explain from the client's perspective what that's like. But that's that's the issue that we deal with. That's why when I'm talking about this is in, these collections become more of a, a legal question. It's okay, you now have this account. How did you get this account? Who did you get the account from? And being able to document all the way back to the original credit card company, how this company that is now before the court has, do they have the appropriate legal standing to bring this claim and that's that's what these uh, that may be an oversimplification of these issues but that's that's really what what they come down to um, and it becomes therefore an industry and I think Dan uh, again indicated you know it is an industry there are thousands of cases filed and um, that that's in some respects that is that's certainly not what small claims was designed for. Thank you. And that answers your question, but if not. But, but it's part of the discussion, I think. Right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions for uh, Judge Gerson? Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Sure. And next up, we'll have uh, Pat Gable, the Vermont State Court Administrator. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and I will be, as soon as I turn off my phone here, <laughs> I will be very brief in my uh, comments. Uh, but I, I, I did want to um, respond to uh, Representative Rachelson's concerns about the issue of education and support of uh, self represented litigants, or as I think of them, unrepresented litigants who are in the court system in this area and many others. Uh, just to let the legislature know that uh, the judiciary is in the process of standing up our access and resource center. And we're doing that uh, with a grant support from the National Center for State Courts. And this center, although uh, physically it will have a space in Costello Courthouse in Burlington, is really being set up uh, to provide statewide support uh, to users of the court system uh, and as you know, most of the users of the court system are not represented by counsel. And so this is a, a uh, will become a big change for us in the sense that, um, you know, historically we perhaps have been more inward focused in terms of uh, our court procedures and the Access and Resource Center is uh, leading the way for us to be much more focused on what you might call in another industry, customer service. And that will be very important for education, training and direct um, uh, support for people who find themselves uh, in the court system uh, without preparation. So we, we're sort of in the early days of setting that up, uh, but it's a very exciting initiative for us. So over time, we really want to uh, um, 
make it easier for people who would rather not be there, <laughs> but they are. And an example in small claims is, uh, and you've heard Dan and Judge Gerson have both been, I think, very articulate in terms of the pros and cons of that docket. But there are a lot of rights that people have as debtors that they wouldn't necessarily know about and um, uh, under certain scenarios would not have the opportunity, for example, the fact that their social security income may not be available to be collected or that sort of thing. And so um, I just wanted the legislature to be aware of um, our activities there and, our, and the resources we hope to stand up for that. Often we find ourselves working on the same issues that you're working on and that's why our, uh, we really appreciate the partnership that we have with House Judiciary as we do problem solving about this. <laughs> uh, you're muted, Representative Burks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Could I, you read my lips? I, I, <laughs> I asked any questions. <laughs> Great, thank you, Pat. Thank you. And, and next we're uh, gonna go out of order a, a little bit and uh, we're gonna, uh, hear from Representative uh, David Iacovone. He has to uh, get get back to his other committee, so he's gonna he's gonna jump in next. Thank you, uh, th thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I don't have a lot to offer. I'll be very brief. I'm very grateful that the committee is looking into this and considering it. I offered it um, in hopes of helping uh, Vermonters that struggled with affording uh, legal representation and by increasing it, it would be helpful that way. Um, I didn't, at the time I introduced it, appreciate the uh, nuances or complexities regarding the credit cards. Um, I am a, as a sponsor though, I would say from what I've heard, I certainly would be supportive of some type of split jurisdictional limits, if you will, to help uh, address that issue. Um, thank you so much for your, your thoughtfulness today. My, I, I wish I could stay, but I can't. Please don't interpret that as uh, indifference or lack of interest. But thank you. No, certainly understand. And uh, I, I think if I had a, a little more experience in the chair seat, I probably would have had you go first, which is uh, okay. a lot of times is the norm, you know, as far as uh, introducing a bill, but but thank you for your input. You're welcome. Thank you, folks. Great. Uh, next, uh, Terry Cressons, the executive uh, director of the Vermont Bar Association. Hi, th thank you, uh, Chair Burdett, and thank you all. I'm Terry Cressons, uh, Vermont Bar Association executive director. Um, Mike Bailey kindly asked me a week a week ago for comments regarding the proposed bill. So I did, the, the, the uh, testimony today is not a, a position of the Vermont Bar Association, but it's based on um, a solicitation of comments from our practice and procedures section, which is a civil uh, practitioners primarily, our solo and small firm section, again, um, practitioners who would be familiar with the small claims docket. And I also communicated with a number of acting judges in small claims, such as Dan Richardson. <laughs> so he and I spoke and I, I did submit a memo that um, Mike has posted that summarizes uh, the comments and also uh, provides an overview of, of many of the issues that have been discussed so far. It's in the, um, in the documents for today. And I also had reached out to Representative Iacovoni just asking in terms of what was the genesis of the proposal and came to find out that attorney David Polo, who is one of his constituents, had suggested it. And in the materials also is a letter from um, attorney Polo describing his perspective and his reasons for requesting it. So I didn't, I wanted to just uh, mention that to you that that's available. The memo also includes a link to what is happening across the 50 states in terms of small claims court jurisdictional limits and other, um, uh, I guess, measures that are, are relevant to, to the proposed bill. Uh, I, I did, in, in terms of the comments that were received, they were universally in uh, support of an increase for many of the reasons that have been described already, uh, particularly by Dan in terms of it offering the Small Claims Court a more economical and quick uh, resolution of cases in this um, within the jurisdictional limit. 
To give you a little bit of a background, when small claims was introduced, $2,000 was the limit, and then that was increased in, to a $3,500 limit in 1995, and then increased to the present $5,000 limit in 2007. So it seems like there's been an increase roughly every 12 to 14 years. <laughs> so just um, as that by way of background. And in the New England states, now the average um, limit is $6,000. And that's based on a range, again, in the six states from Rhode Island with 2,500 and New Hampshire with 10,000. Nationwide, it appears that the average um, is about 8,500, ranging again from 2,500 being the lowest and 25,000 um, in a couple of states is the highest. So it seems as if the, the proposed limit is within the range of what's happening. I do have actually a New England Bar Association meeting today at noon and I asked for this to be on the agenda. I'm happy to check and see if any of the other New England states are considering um, adjustments to their limits, but that would be helpful information to you. Uh, but I wanted to just- I think that would be, that's great, Terry. Okay, just I'm trying to kind of touch upon things that might not have been touched upon before so as not to repeat um, too much. Um, in terms of the, the concerns about credit card cases, and those were included in the comments that practitioners had, a concern that this would um, you know, cause a flood of credit card cases within that new range. Um, but the um, mention that has been made of what other states have done in terms of the example that in the memo is in Washington, I'm sorry, in Minnesota, for example, the small claims limit is 15,000, but is 4,000 for claims involving consumer credit transactions. Another example is in Washington state, the small claims limit is 10,000 if brought by a natural person, um, an individual versus a company or an entity, and is $5,000 for all other cases. So I do agree with everyone saying that there is a in those cases. I, I served as an acting judge in small claims court in Rutland for a number of years um, and agree with Judge Gerson and Dan Richardson that it, it's a very um, helpful, I think, and efficient vehicle for the cases that small claims court was designed to let people come in and um, have a um, you know, quick and fair resolution of their issues. To give you an example of the time frame, the Disposition goal that the Supreme Court sets for small claims court cases is four months, and the disposition goal for uh, standard cases in the, they call it major civil or the other civil division cases, is 18 months. So there's that difference in the time frame. The filing fee in the regular civil division is $295. The filing fee in small claims currently is $65 if it's 1000 or less, or $90 if it's more than 1000 so there is quite a bit of difference in terms of the cost and that's completely exclusive of attorney's fees. So I, I think um, any, personally, <laughs> any efforts to make um, small claims more accessible for those cases that it was designed for, for Vermonters who wanna be able to have a, an economical and um, expeditious way to handle these disputes, um, I think it, it would be helpful to um, make it as accessible as possible. Um, the other, um, only other thing I was going to just mention, so as not to repeat what has been said already, um, in terms of acting judges, and I don't, it looks like Judge Grierson, Good, and Pat are still on. One thing that occurred to me, because I, I feel that the work that acting judges have done in the small claims court has been very invaluable. Typically, it's done completely voluntarily. There's a very nominal, I think, stipend that's available. I know I never put in for it, and I think most of the acting judges didn't, so it's a volunteer um, service. Um, with the Odyssey, my question would be whether or not it wouldn't be possible to allow just limited access, very limited access, only to the small claims docket to acting judges, and only limited access, access to that small handful of small claims court orders that would be through Odyssey if that would be a way to, um, I guess, accommodate uh, and acknowledge the, you know, the fact that it'll be e-filing statewide, you know, within the next year. And if that would be one way that practitioners and typically the acting judges in small claims are very uh, experienced civil trial practitioners for them to be able to um, provide a service and assist, especially given the fact that I'm just gonna assume that the the caseload in civil division is going to increase 
very dramatically once the moratorium on evictions and foreclosures is lifted and, and the backlog that's been building up during the pandemic in general, if this wouldn't be a way that um, the bar would be able to help um, in the small claims docket and because the regular superior court judges who are doing small claims now, I'm sure, may not have as av much availability for the small claims docket so that it's not um, neglected you know, down the road. So that, that was the only other thing I was going to add that suggestion as to whether or not that might be feasible. Otherwise, as Judge Grierson said, certainly for the Civil Division Oversight Committee and the Rules Committee to weigh in, and I'm happy to solicit other comments from the bar in general, but those were the uh, comments that were received from act, the acting uh, small claims judges whom I communicated with, and then the sections that typically work in the Civil Division. Oh, oh, one other thing I was going to mention, uh, Representative Rachel Sun, when you'd asked about an automatic increase, there is there was one state that did build in a every five years an adjustment based on the consumer price index, and that was in uh, Nebraska. So there was that, <laughs> um, I guess, possibility. Great, thank you, Terry. Any questions for Terry? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. And next up, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll hear from uh, Falco Schilling, uh, advocate, advocacy director of the ACLU. Good morning. And for the record, my name is Falco Schilling. I'm the advocacy director for the ACLU of Vermont. And thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, since this isn't a short form bill, my testimony will also be quite brief. Um, so this is an issue that after receiving the request for testimony, I circled back with some of the attorneys in our office um, about this bill to get their thoughts. And as the bill stands right now, we're not supportive of the bill as drafted, um, which is you know looking at the jurisdictional limit increase for a number of the reasons that folks have expressed today, largely about um, the power imbalances that will be created by increasing this limit, especially for lower income Vermonters who are unrepresented and then having to adjudicate claims of an even higher amount against companies that are providing well-represented uh, attorneys uh, against those claims. So that's one of our major concerns. Also just the general lack of due process that does exist within uh, many of the small claims courts, increasing that jurisdictional limit um, could uh, have a negative impact on folks for a higher amount uh, who are being uh, adjudicated against for a higher amount than they currently are. Um, though it's been it's been a good discussion, um, and as the committee looks at this bill moving forward, if they have tweaks or changes or new proposals, be happy to look at those and um, examine those. But just looking at the bill as it is today, um, with just the straight up raising the jurisdictional limit, that is not something that we are supportive of. Great, thank you. Any questions, Selena? Um, do you think the do you think the proposal around the split jurisdictional limits with credit card companies in particular gets at your concerns, or is there my my suspicion from what you've just stated is there you know there still might be a whole universe That's something of, other I, I, kinds of claims out there that would still be tough for people. So I, that's something that I would like to talk to some of the attorneys um, in my office who have a little bit more experience on. Uh, I think the issues that be, need to be considered in a proposal like that would be how we define uh, who is bringing those claims, what creditors are bringing those claims, um, and then what those limits are. So those are two things that I think would definitely need to be considered in any proposal like that. Any other questions? Great, thank you. Thank you. And next up we have uh, the staff attorney for Vermont Legal Aid, Jean Murray. Thank you uh, very much. I am Jean Murray. I'm a staff attorney at Vermont Legal Aid. I have been involved in credit card collections, well, not just credit card collections, collection cases um, for over a decade. I came to the practice um, in the last time we were in an economic downturn. And at that time, the filings in 
both Superior Court and Small Claims Court were double what they are now. So I really appreciate this committee taking an opportunity to think about how best to administer justice, both across Small Claims and the Superior Court. I am not shy about getting very concrete about what these numbers are and what is actually going on with credit card cases and small claims. Um, I recommend to you, because this is where I started, every year the judiciary makes a report about um, the cases that it uh, hears in all its uh, different dockets, in, in the civil docket, in the um, criminal docket, et cetera. In the civil docket, 70% um, of the cases across both Superior Court and Small Claims Court are um, corporations and businesses suing debtors. And that, so I'm including in that 70% foreclosure, um, eviction, and uh, collections cases. Collections cases in Superior Court represent 20% of the docket. In small claims, credit card collection cases represent 70% of the docket. I have uh, compared one year to another. I think I was looking at fiscal year 2018 and 2019. And in one year, um, the percentage, if you look at it by the credit card company that is suing, in one year, um, each credit card company that was suing or debt buyer that was suing um, moved more cases into small claims. So going from 83% one year to 89% the next year, going from 95% one year to 98% of the cases that Midland Funding, which is a debt buyer of credit card cases, 98% of them in fiscal year 2019 were filed in small claims. So why is small claims so attractive to uh, these corporations? because the rules of small claims are relaxed. They don't have to bring, um, they don't have to meet an evidentiary standard that they would in superior court. The way the process is set up, it's set up to be um, regular people um, being able to bring their disputes. So the forms for um, answers are simplified, which credit card companies take advantage of. So I appreciate that to, to take a broader view of how um, the courts are administering justice is I think an appropriate thing to do right now during the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> of all the people who, of the defendants who are represented in collection cases, in superior court, maybe 10% of the defendants are represented by counsel. In small claims court, only 2% are represented by counsel. And if we take me out of it, me personally, one attorney at Vermont Legal Aid, it goes down to 1% are represented by counsel. In the last 10 years, I have represented over 600 people in debt collection cases, and that includes both credit card cases and, and um, repossession deficiencies, which are mostly in Superior Court. Um, so uh, a hundred percent of credit card um, collection cases are represented by attorneys compared to 2% of, um, of defendants in small claims. So to me, if you look at how the system balances, it doesn't. And what does this have to do with a $10,000 limit in small claims court? It just means if taken how the rules are today, if uh, the limit was increased to $10,000, uh, credit card collectors would abandon <laughs> superior court altogether they really don't like to have to prove things according to the rules of evidence and they'd be in small claims. And that, what that would do to my way of thinking would be to just turn a piece of the Vermont judiciary into a rubber stamp for collections for credit cards. Because with that volume of cases, um, 
whether it's regular judges or acting judges, people like uh, Dan Richardson said, it feels like an assembly line already. The notion that um, these cases should actually take time and require people to prove, require credit card companies to prove their cases. Uh, the temptation would be great to figure out a more efficient way of doing that. So look at it from the other side, which is what happens to defendants, what happens to individual people who are brought to court for the first time. Um, Gene, before you get on to your next topic, can I, can I ha have uh, Selena jump in with a question? Sure. I can't actually wait um, okay. in, until the testimony is complete. I just wanted to get into the queue. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so one of the other really astounding things that I've observed, because I was able to obtain the data of all of the actual cases, all the data that um, the judiciary uses to make its report, I was able to obtain that. And so I was able to, to count um, people that fit into different categories. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, that, um, oh, the attorneys, the credit card companies, um, when they sue, they need to use, um, because of some federal rules that pass, they need to use uh, law firms that are able to uh, comply with certain um, confidential, confidentiality rules around credit card information, right? So it turns out that most of the credit card cases in Vermont are brought by attorneys from out-of-state firms. Well, they're admitted in Vermont, but the firm is actually outside of the state of Vermont. Most of the credit card cases are brought by just a handful of attorneys. 64% of the cases in small claims were brought by just three attorneys. How many cases are brought in small claims? About 5,000 cases are brought in small claims in the years that I was studying. And as I say, 70% of them are credit card cases. So that means three attorneys are filing 64% of all of the cases in small claims. One attorney between the 100 and so cases that he signed the pleadings for in Superior Court and the um, 1,900 cases he signed the pleadings for in small claims court, one attorney in one year signed the pleadings for 2,000 cases. So I'm an officer of the court and I wanna fo follow all of the ethical rules and I wanna follow all of the pleading rules. And one of the ethical rules is when you sign a pleading, you have to know that the evidence uh, exists for the claim that you're bringing. So you have to review the evidence in order to sign the pleadings, or at least the evidence at the beginning of the case, you need to review that. So if somebody is signing pleadings for 2000 cases a year, how much time do they have to review the evidence for each case? So I say that as a way of illustrating what I think is the size of the problem. The, the problem is that already in small claims, credit card companies are the big gorilla and they can sit wherever they want. They can ask for what they want. In order for these three or four attorneys to be able to, to uh, come to the hearings that are scheduled, already the clerks in the various counties have to coordinate with each other and stagger their collections days so the attorneys can be able to appear. Now, if I would love to go to the court and say, hey, please stagger all of my cases so um, I can appear in this, but as a person who only represents 60 to 100 defendants a year, I don't have the weight to pull that off. Credit card companies do. So um, what does this have to do with jurisdictional limit? Uh, it doesn't really. I, if it were not for credit card cases, if there, it was not for 
represented corporations using small claims to sue unrepresented people, I don't have really much of an opinion about the jurisdictional limit. But one of the things that I really want to advocate for is that people look at the whole system and how it is being used and who it is being used against. Um, and I think, um, I mean, I've identified credit card collections as a place where the playing field is not even. Um, and so to the extent that the jurisdictional limit further makes that playing field unequal, um, I, I oppose it. Um, but the other thing I know, and uh, Dan Richardson and Judge uh, Grierson um, have already mentioned it, is right now, the regular processes in the judiciary, which have to do with rules committees um, and oversight committees, they're considering this question of um, how best to administer justice in credit card cases. And they're doing that right now. As a matter of fact, um, I have been looking forward for two months to the civil oversight meeting, which was this morning at nine o'clock. And then this committee scheduled this. And I'm like, how can I be in two places at once? It, it worked out. Um, but like, it's, it's one of those things. Even as we speak, things are changing. Um, but I would not want one thing to get tinkered with without looking at what the whole uh, system is doing to individuals. Ah, that's the other thing I was gonna briefly touch on. What happens to an individual who's brought and gets a judgment against them? Small claims judgments are not, you know, mini judgments. They are judgments that can be used just like any other judgment. A judgment can be a lien on real property. A judgment can give the judgment creditor um, the ability to seek a wage assignment. Um, a judgment can um, give the judgment creditor an ability to freeze a bank account. Um, all of those things get done. The, the anomaly that happened in the Northeast Kingdom a couple of years ago where, um, and it wasn't, I gotta say, it was not a credit card collector that was doing it. It was another kind of creditor was using the small claims court to get people arrested in order to squeeze money out of them, which should never have happened. Um, but it did call attention to uh, that uh, there, there needs to be um, an understanding and, a, and a, a better administration of how things happen in small claims court. So if, you, if I'm a defendant and I have a judgment against me right now in Vermont, that accrues 12% interest, which means, um, and I think Dan Richardson mentioned this, sometimes um, the 12% interest, uh, the, the form in small claims that says, I will go ahead and make this payment plan. If the person doesn't estimate the payment large enough to cover the 12% accruing interest, then they could be paying forever. There's another thing in Vermont, which allows, um, there's a statute of limitations on judgments. They're only good for eight years, but they can be renewed um, by filing a new case in court. And so a judgment and the ability to collect on it could be extended forever, forever. There's nothing that limits it from how long it could be extended and 12% interest is accruing the whole time. Um, people are exempt from collection. When they're exempt from collection, that does not mean interest is suspended on a judgment. And so um, if the reason you're exempt from collection, let's say is because you are suffering a a temporary setback or a loss of income for a temporary reason. Once you uh, get your income back, um, you could the judgment is still there, still accruing 12% interest. Um, our exemption laws aren't quite. Our exemption laws says your income, if your income is less than the federal minimum wage times 40 hours a week which is $7.25 times 40, which is $290 a week, that income is exempt from collection. Right now, Vermont's minimum wage is $11, and that would make $400 a week exempt from collection, but that's not our law right now. So there are um, a number of things where a judgment in small claims or superior court 
could, um, and somebody had a, a question about um, statute of limitations and credit reporting. A credit card, any, anybody who believes they are owed a debt needs to file uh, a lawsuit within six years or they lose the ability to file a lawsuit. Credit card collectors believe that their inability to file a lawsuit does not mean that they are unable to collect. So they can keep trying to collect. So once somebody misses a payment on a credit card, the credit card company calls the credit bureaus and says a payment is missed. That first time that's called an adverse action. The federal law says adverse actions can only be on your credit report for seven years since the first report. So it would, whether it gets paid or not, it should fall off a credit report after seven years, except if someone gets a judgment, that's a new adverse action that starts that seven year clock running again. Um, should the fact that the original credit card debt get sold to a um, debt, a debt buyer uh, start the clock again? No, it shouldn't. But as a matter of fact, it often does um, because of sloppy reporting. So um, what, if, you, if there's a judgment against you, your financial life could get wrecked for quite some time. And what does that mean? That means when you try to apply for an apartment, somebody does a credit check and you don't get the apartment. It means that you you're, could find your bank account suddenly empty or frozen. Um, it means that you are operating under a stress for a long time. So I want credit card cases in the first instance, whether or not the credit card company is entitled to a judgment and how much of a judgment are they entitled to. I want that to be adjudicated under the same rules and laws that any other person gets to bring to court. I don't see why it sh there should be a lesser form of judges justice simply because there are so many credit card cases. I, I get a little wound up about this stuff. I really thank you for your kind attention. <laughs> um, so I, I hope this committee uh, continues to think about um, things like jurisdictional limit and, and the other issues that I've mentioned. Um, and I, I don't think it, to me, this thing isn't a yes or a no, it's how do we make the whole thing better? Great, thank you. We, we appreciate your commitment and passion for sure. Uh, uh, we, have, oh, we have three people now. First, uh, Selena, then Barbara, and then uh, Coach. Thank you so much. This has been really, really helpful and compelling, and, and thank you for your work. Um, and I will just know I, I was we were I was just recalling we did have a bill a few years back that was really looking at um, I believe was really looking at um, credit card collection and that legal aid was a very powerful advocate for and my memory is that that bill didn't make it across the finish line but your testimony today is making me feel like we really ought to revisit um, that subject and those proposals. But that is an aside. Uh, and my question is, so you have spoken a lot about sort of, I guess what I would call the predatory collection practices of credit card companies. I don't wanna put words in your mouth there, but, um, but I'm wondering if there's other frequent represented corporate plaintiffs who are also commonly bringing these collection cases, kinds of collection cases to small claims, or if it really is largely or, or purely limited to credit card companies? Um, from my study and the way I do it, because the judiciary doesn't quite keep this data, but I am familiar enough with the names of plaintiffs that I can identify this plaintiff as, a, as an original creditor credit card company. This plaintiff is a debt buyer of credit cards. Um, so it is a little surprising. It is mostly credit cards, um, both the original creditors and the debt buyers. Uh, the next biggest plaintiff in small claims is actually the Department of Labor. <laughs> 
trying to recoup um, overpaid unemployment benefits. Um, in terms of the credit collectors altogether, they aren't in small claims. The next biggest group is um, the auto um, finance lenders. And they are coming to court after they have repossessed vehicles and they're coming for the repossession deficiency. Um, they aren't as, there aren't as many of those as there are credit uh, card collections. So for instance, if I took all the numbers for credit card collections, both in superior court and in small claims, it comes out to in fiscal year 2019, something like um, 5,000 and auto repossession collectors are um, maybe 400 cases a year. Um, and certainly I'm not even looking at the foreclosure docket. If you wanted to look at banks as big corporations who are suing, um, that is about 20% of the civil docket, which means about a thousand cases a year. Um, back a decade ago at the, in the economic downturn, it was 2000 cases a year, 2,500 cases a year. Um, so, uh, so. And I guess a follow-up question, really what I'm trying to get at with this question is to understand if this bill, if we followed the suggestion of some of the witnesses and we did a split jurisdictional limit so that credit cards sort of stayed at the current, current limit or maybe we could go lower. Um, and the and the other claims went up to a $10,000 limit is the bill really supportable at that point, or is there does there remain a sort of smaller but universe of folks who are still subject to claims from represented corporate lenders of other kinds that would then like we, we wouldn't want to carve out just this one group when there's this smaller universe of folks with the exact same issue, right? Right. So nationally. Um, people who pay attention to collections. Nationally, people look at medical debt collections. Um, they look at, um, well, it, it, I guess I lump them in with credit card collections because I have had a number of cases where somebody um, got some dental work or got a computer or whatever, and wherever they went to finance that, was essentially a credit card company. They didn't know it at the time, but their dentist had a brochure that said, use this to finance this. So um, there is a little bit of that kind of um, medical debt, um, things that wouldn't be covered by insurance or Medicaid. There's a little bit of that kind of uh, debt collection in small claims. Um, there is some, not as much as you would imagine, but there is some for the, um, places that rent home furnishings like Rent-A-Center or Aaron's um, or other places, they do come to small claims every once in a while to try to pursue debt collection, but not as much as you would think um, that they do. And there is a, there is a um, really thorough um, bill about um, those kind of rent to own uh, personal goods things that Vermont has already protected consumers on that front. So um, if people were represented by counsel, and I've done a couple of those rent-a-center kind of cases, um, the, and I say rent-a-center as a general thing because I wasn't exactly, it was never a rent-a-center that I was uh, the opposing party. At. Represented by counsel, people can do pretty well in those cases, but I don't know if anybody can do well not represented by counsel with those kind of complicated um, cases. That's helpful, thank you. Barbara? Um, thank you so much. I am wondering, it sounds like um, corporate um, businesses or corporations sort of hijacked um, small claims courts. And so I'm wondering, 
if it makes sense to define what a small claims court is and really have it be individual, you know, go back to the individuals, have a way to address other individuals and just because it doesn't matter if it, as you said, if it's um, what kind of company, but like somebody who's gonna um, sort of game the system. And I've got to say 12%, like that has got to be readjusted for, like you, where can you get 12% interest um, anywhere? Like you could see why people would be trying to get as much of that. Like that needs to have, um, I'm hoping no matter what that we look at that and say, look, right now the interest rate, you know, it can't be more than 1% of a prime or something. Like it, it is, maybe I'm not using the right term, but that is really taking advantage. And same thing with the 290 a week, like it's, it's got to be tied to, to something. Um, but I think, I feel like small claims courts had a really important purpose and now we're all of a sudden we're hijacked and we're held hostage by not doing what's right for the little guys because the big guys have are taking advantage. And I'm wondering, and maybe Terry knows, but has some state addressed this? And can we legally do anything about this? Um, I I have got to just say that it is appalling. Um, and I appreciate you doing the data crunching for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I, w I would appreciate um, somebody besides me <laughs> doing the data crunching because I know from civil oversight, the, the fellow that represents uh, credit card collectors, Alan Bierke, he looks at the same data set I do and he crunches it and he comes up with one thing and I come up with another thing. And I don't think... Um, I don't want to undercut myself. I really do believe these are basically the numbers, but um, I think it would be worthwhile to figure out what exactly is is going on. Um, so, when I was in, uh, when Legal Aid was invited to come talk to this committee, I did some phone calling around to try and figure out how this, what what was behind this proposal, and I ended up talking to Attorney David, pa well emailing back and forth with attorney David Paolo. And his notion was that small claims court would be able, if you raise the jurisdictional limit, then unrepresented, to, unrepresented plaintiffs could have a better chance of getting justice from insurance companies uh, that, were, that they couldn't otherwise afford to take to court. And certainly um, as, a, as a legal aid lawyer, I would like to know that small claims court is there for tenants to sue to get their security deposits back when sometimes landlords aren't willing to give them or to be able to you know, um, get the value of things that have been destroyed by someone else. I used to do a lot of uh, family law and you know, people who are not married but had relationships with each other and somebody walks off with the car and doesn't pay for it, um, you wanna be able to go back and say, hey, pay me back for the car you took. So I think, I mean, I can think of a lot of ways that small claims would be very, very helpful to just regular people. And I don't, I don't want there to be no small claims. I, and I'm not even sure that I, I want, um, I, I, for regular people, I, I, I guess I haven't given it a ton of thought. Like what would I adjust about the the um, procedural rules and the evidentiary rules, what would I adjust so that regular people could do uh, small claims better? Maybe a few things, but it's the way it is now, it is fine for regular people. It is just not fine for uh, credit card corporations to take advantage of. It, in my, I mean, I guess one of the things I think is that if any of you remember the foreclosure crisis, the federal government came and gave banks a lot of money so that they could do modifications of the loans so that people wouldn't lose their homes. And then it turned out that banks weren't actually doing that. And so Vermont um, 
made it so that all the banks had to go to mediation to prove that they were going through the steps to qualify that folks were um, qualified for these modifications so that they could keep their homes. That whole process is called loss mitigation. And the banks could have always had a loss mitigation department to work with their consumers so that um, people could get back in good stead with their credit. So credit card companies could do that too. They could have loss mitigation. They could do things to get their um, borrowers back in good stead. But because courts are so easy and so accessible for them, they come to court instead. They don't maintain their own internal loss mitigation rehabilitation departments, but they come to court and get judgments. So, you know, I would like to make it difficult for credit card companies to get judgments um, because I think if they got backed up that way, they may go back to instituting loss mitigation uh, rehabilitation departments. Thank you. Uh, Coach? Jean, thank you very, very much um, for your advocacy and legal aids uh, advocacy. Um, the bill that uh, Selena was referring to is uh, H904, uh, and it was in the, uh, uh, the last session. Uh, mm -hmm. It didn't come to our committee, uh, which I find uh, interesting. Uh, even though a lot of the statutory requirements uh, seem to fall within uh, our jurisdiction. Um, and the 12% was part of that, uh, that bill's discussion. Um, almost everything you said in your, in your testimony was in uh, uh, this bill, uh, this proposed bill. Um, I, I, I'm i trying to think other than what you've already answered for us uh, with uh, Representative Racheldson's questions and Representative uh, Colburn's uh, uh, questions. Um, if you were uh, leader of the world and uh, <laughs> you can <laughs> and and you could propose uh, uh, a bill for us to look at um, you know without you know getting into the the minute detail <clears throat> what what would that be um it's, it's interesting because I've been, uh, Senator Clarkson has uh, started a conversation about uh, statute of limitations. Um, in the bill that we worked on before, one of the, pro the problems of statute of limitations is the reviving of debt by making a payment. So let's say I couldn't pay on my credit card and a year went by we have a six year statute of limitations, they would have five years to sue me. But I decide I'm gonna dig in and start making a payment. Once I make a payment, the six years starts over again. So one of the things that we had in that bill was that um, making a payment didn't revive the, the statute of limitations time clock. Um, other states have shorter statute of limitations, other states have longer statute of limitations, but um, the amount of time that the possibility of being sued hangs over your head is, is an important thing. Um, I, to me, taking the word federal out of 12 VSA 3170, which is it, federal precedes minimum wage, taking the word federal out of it would be the easiest thing to do because then that would exempt Vermont minimum wage and it would protect a whole lot of other struggling families um, from being compelled to pay debts through wage assignment and for other reasons. It would exempt those people who are um, working at minimum wage. Um, the 
one of the places in that bill that was the most worked out between all of the parties had to do with the process for um, bank freezes. So if the, when you're a judgment creditor, reaching out to a, somebody else and saying, you're holding the money of somebody who owes me money. It's called <clears throat> trustee process. So an employer is subject to trustee process in the, in the form of wage assignment, and a bank is subject to trustee process in the terms of money held in the account. The process that Vermont has for um, the summons to trustee, which is freeze the account to let the court decide how much of what's in the account should go to the creditor, that process does not work. It is not uniform. It is used differently. People respond to it differently. <laughs> and so one of the parts of that bill that we had all worked out was to uh, address that, that trustee process on banks and assuring that the orders that go to banks to hold on to somebody's money um, never made them ref refuse the minimum amount of money which right now is $700. It, should, it was set at $700 in the 1980s. In other words, you have a bank account with money in it, $700 should never go to a creditor. Um, it should be there for you to be able to pay your bills. Well, in the 80s, maybe a month's worth of bills was $700. It, if you took that $700 and translated it into today's money, it would be closer to $1,700. Um, and yet we're only protecting $700. So. Um, so, okay, major categories, I would do something to update the exemptions. I would do something to change the interest rate, at least on judgments based on consumer debt. Um, I would do something um, to change, to do some protections um, around the statute of limitations. And I would do something to make it that a judgment could not be renewed in perpetuity. I had a person come to me who was being sued in Vermont and it was based on a debt from 20 years before. And 20 years before she had lived in New Hampshire and had fled a domestic violence situation. So she didn't get her mail. So a credit card case became a judgment in New Hampshire. And then that got imported into Vermont and um, with full faith and credit and renewed into a Vermont judgment. She didn't know about that and then renewed again. She didn't know about that. And it was the third time that it they were seeking to renew it that they finally got a hold of her and served her with it. And she went, I know about this credit card debt. My son was two at the time. He just graduated college. I mean, that kind of situation shouldn't ever, ever exist that a, a, a judgment can be renewed forever. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. So um, those are the things that I would change. Uh, Jean, thank you um, uh, very much. That is very helpful. Thank you. Any other questions? Selena, is your hand up? <laughs> yeah, it is. So I'm just, I'm, I'm noting that today is our bill drafting deadline. And I'm sort of looking at the history of the, this, so this is a little bit of a side of ways question. I'm looking at the history of the um, legis larger legislation on this issue. And um, both, it looks like as coach noted, Representative Marcotte introduced a bill last biennium. And there was a bill as, as I think you know, we're noting that um, made it through the House, but not the Senate with a lot of debate and discussion. And that did come through the Judiciary Committee. I'm just wondering if legal, if you know if legal aid is working on a reintroduction of that um, this biennium. I, I can follow up with Wendy Morgan if not. Well, it, it, I'd appreciate it if you contacted Wendy. So since the pandemic and the shutdown, um, as, as passionate as I am about debt collection, I have had to switch and really work on um, protecting um, renters. So 
Legal Aid has worked on the eviction moratorium and we expect that we're gonna do that again um, this session. And we uh, worked a lot on and with the rent payment program. And we will be doing that again because there's now new federal money. So in other words, I, I really think debt collection deserves attention, but when we looked at all of the things that we were working on and, and the resources that we had for them, we, we, me, I, Wendy, Legal Aid generally is focusing a lot of its time on keeping Vermonters housed right now. And so um, as much as I would like to um, renew some of the ideas in the bill we had last biennium, or go forward, we didn't actually think that the legislature would have capacity to uh, deal, and we didn't. And I, I really regret that, um, but I. That's very helpful context. And I'm reminding myself that it's a two year biennium. So maybe, maybe there's some collaborative work that some of us could do on this heading into next session when maybe our capacity will look different. And I would, I would I feel really working with you and others on that. Any other questions for Jean? Great, thank you, Jean. Thank you very much. Uh, committee, I guess we'll be wrapping up for the, uh, uh, for the day in the week. Um, yeah, a check, uh, I don't, I don't think the agenda is out yet for next week, but if it's not out today, it'll definitely be out by Monday and um, we'll see what we have going forward. And thank you to all our witnesses and uh, have a great weekend and enjoy the sunshine from the inside because it's cold outside.